And good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Walinka. I'm a professor of communication and culture at Royal Roads University, and welcome to our webinar series, Sport, Leadership, and Social Change. For this episode, we are going to be discussing culture and uh, the idea of being a cultural collaborative across our country, our sport system, with a focus on building cultural integrity across the Canadian sports system. Today is part two of our series. We had part, part one was a recording that I shared recently uh, working with a group of practitioners in this area who work with organizations in sport to foster cultural development. And today we'll be speaking with national uh, and multi-sport organizational leaders. We have two leaders today in person, I mean virtual, but in person. And then we have uh, a couple of bonus reels lined up with a representative of the Culture of Excellence program with on the podium, Adrian Leslie Tugood, and also a representative from Rugby Canada, that I'll be conducting more as a bonus reel recording interview and then post those to the website. All of these recordings go out to you through various channels and you can uh, watch them on your own anytime. So welcome to those who are attending. I see some familiar faces and names and I'll be introducing our guests shortly, but I'll just start with a little preamble. I always want to start by acknowledging and thanking the Lekwungen and Kosepsen First Nations. They are our partners on our lands at Royal Roads University. And you can see we, we are lucky enough to live and work, play, teach, learn on these unceded territories. We're on 300 hectares of old growth forest. We have one of the oldest trees in Canada on our campus. And uh, it's a fantastic place to learn. We also take very seriously our responsibility in the process of truth and reconciliation. Part of that, of course, even though we're not directly responsible for inflicting harms, but our responsibility is to ensure that we're reconciling our practices and actions with the values we uphold of, of equity and respect. We learn from the land. Definitely, uh, you know, I find, especially in communication, we're constantly thinking about the interdependence and the connections between creatures and beings and forces in nature, and it stares us in the face. We actually use the gardens and the, these artifacts like this bridge to illustrate or represent a metaphor of our vision in our school of, of being careful to mind the gap before we try to bridge through communication. So really embracing the importance of difference and, and diversity as part of that act of communication. And like our land, uh, in many ways, sport has much to teach us. And that's why this webinar really focuses on the topic of sport. What principles can we learn from sport that can guide us in our actions, our behaviors, our organizations, our um, practice? And I row backwards in that skinny boat every day and it teaches me something every single day. But right now, you know, our sport system is facing some challenges that we're tackling through this webinar, but we're also trying to promote what's working. What are some of the practices out there in our system that are functioning well? At Royal Roads, we, uh, we partner with a number of organizations, but we also partner with the learner. And we try to, like we've said, we acknowledge that learning takes place everywhere, uh, whether it's in a skinny boat on the water or out in the, in the forest or, or wherever in your professional experience as well. And so we acknowledge that learning as part of your credit when you're entering our university. And we do that for athletes as well. Sport has played a huge role in terms of social change, positive social change, uh, with many organizations and movements taking up the topics of things like equity and respect. And our programs try to reflect these same kind of principles around social purpose. We have programs in development, diversity, education, environment, justice, health, media, communication, and, and peace and conflict. We also offer uh, programming in this area, and we partner with various organizations such as Game Plan and the CFL Players Association to deliver more customized programming around sport leadership. And that has led us to this series because during uh, COVID, we found we were looking for alternative ways of sharing information. Of course, we, we have online programming, but we were really leveraging the power of webinars. And lo and behold, this has really carried on. There's been a lot of great opportunities to discuss topics within sport and leadership and social change. And today I want to introduce you to two individuals who've been kind enough to join me and share the work they've been doing. Craig Devlin is the High Performance Director with Boxing Canada, 
And we have Mark Schreiber, who's the Hub Performance Director with Speed Skating Canada. And both have been working hard on cultural development. So it's a great opportunity to hear their stories, hear what kind of uh, approaches they've taken, what their learnings have been. I'll also be sharing recordings with representatives from Rugby Canada who have been undertaking the same kind of work for the last couple of years. And uh, Adrian Leslie Tugood, who is the lead with the Culture of Excellence program at On the Podium, uh, where they, well, we'll talk more about that as we get into it with Craig and Mark. I wanna remind you that you can pose your questions in the chat. You can also share what lands you're coming from. Uh, you can also share any uh, commentary that you have. I'll try and monitor the chat as we go along and we try to weave those comments and questions into our discussion. It's a very free flowing discussion. I've asked uh, both Mark and Craig to share their experiences, but they can share their screen and some of the initiatives that they might be working on. And I think this is all to the benefit of our community that they're, they're learning some really great practice. There's some contact information here as well. And this, of course, will all be included in the recording, as well as any resources that come up in our conversation. We like to track those and make sure we make those available afterward because it's tough, right? You're in a webinar and someone mentions a book or a, a person or a presentation or a website and, and you think, what is that again? And so we'll try to include those. Want to also highlight that coming up, we have part three and four to this suite of webinars episodes um, from academics and then also athletes and activists and we have some dates assigned to some of those already and then I'm working on one around sport a kind of a checkup on sport and gender equity around April 4th and we'd love to hear your ideas reach out to me anytime there's my contact information any ideas that you might have for these kind of webinars and let's get started so I always start by asking our guests if they could introduce themselves a little more completely in that, uh, tell us a bit about your roles, your responsibilities, and also your path into sport. What's drawn you to sport? What's kept you in the, this role of leadership within sport? And why don't I, anybody want to go first or do I just volunteer to you? Whoever has their mic on first. <laughs> I, expect, go ahead. I, 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 can, I can put my mic on, but uh, Mark can go first too as well. Up, up to. Go for it, Craig. Well, okay. Thanks, John. Um, so first of all, th thanks for having uh, myself on to represent Boxing Canada. It's going to be a, a pleasure to share what we've been doing. Um, so, so really, so my role in sports right now is as a, a high performance team leader, essentially. Um, and the current position I hold is as the high performance director for Boxing Canada. Um, I will also say that grassroots coaching is, is a great passion of mine. So uh, in my main sport, which is another combat sport, karate, I maintain a club here in Victoria. And in any given day, I can be working with six-year-olds, new initiates into karate in my tykes program, up to uh, 18, 19-year-old athletes who are on the national team and preparing for, for Pan American championships. Outstanding. And uh, Craig and I know each other because I helped Craig facilitate some of the cultural development work. So we actually worked as, as kind of partners through that process. And I really got to know more about boxing, which was so exciting, but also more about the work that Craig's been doing. And uh, that led us to then do some research afterward as well as a kind of follow up. It's amazing how we all get connected. But can you, um, Mark, why don't you tell us a bit about your role as well? And then we'll go back to that question about why sport for you? Go ahead, Mark. Perfect. So I'm the high performance director for the short track program. So under Speed Skating Canada, there are two separate disciplines, even if they're uh, connected. So we have the long track program based in Calgary. So they have their own high performance director. His name is Mark Wild. I am based in Montreal. Our national training center is at Arena Maurice Richard next to the Olympic Stadium. And I manage the program for the short track team. Danny. Okay, and Mark, why don't we carry on with you? What led you into sport? What's that background? What's the path into this role that you're currently? I know I've, you've held lots of different leadership roles, but yeah. Tell okay, us. I'm going to share my screen because you offered that to us. Yep. In a one page or it'd be a bit more visual. Can you let me let me know if you see it, Jennifer? Yes, perfect. So very quickly at the bottom for about 15, 20 years of my career. So it, that gives you uh, the age I may have. I have been involved in education. So I was a teacher, twice a high school principal, 
I gave in a couple of classes at Bishop's uh, in the Sherbrooke area. And at the top there with the uh, black circle was another 15 to 20 years where I'm currently involved, which is in sport management and always more at the high performance level. So I worked at Cirque du Soleil as director of coaching and now I'm right here with Speed Skin in Canada. But to me, both worlds actually interconnect with the fact that I'm passionate about coaching. I've always worked with coaches in different sports. I coach in six different sports myself, and I'm passionate about coach education. So I did work with the Coaching Association of Canada for a certain number of years also, and that's been my passion. So I, I, I think I'm fairly lucky because I see myself as a coach coaching coaches. So I still see myself as a coach um, and I have a, a chance to be a coach educator while being a sport manager and all that linked to education because while I was working and helping teacher being better and efficient in their classrooms, I think it's almost the same with my coaches being efficient with their athletes on the ice or off the ice. Love that link, right? Yeah, and that's to my point that we can learn so much from sport because that model of coach, mentor, mentee, coach, athlete is really, I think, the main relationship in the world. And so we're, sure. sometimes we're a coach, sometimes we're in the athlete role. And I love it. Yeah. There you go. And Craig. Uh, why is it important to me? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I, I grew up trying different sports, but I ultimately landed on on uh, an activity that is half sport and and half way as they call it. So karate is where I kind of landed. So and the translation of karate do is do is is way and way is this it's this infusing of the physical with the in some cases spiritual or psychological. So I think I was lucky that I had this early indoctrination into a a physical practice that had some values based around it. You know, there, there are rules and re, uh, and values kind of in, in a dojo. So, so as I kind of progressed into out of, out of the practice of it for internal and became an athlete myself and competing through the, the pathway through to the national program and then converting that experience into a national coaching pathway. And I was with, um, with Karate Canada for 14 years as a coach and did much of my education and the experience kind of under that umbrella of uh, of a karate coach. Um, I always had this indoctrination of a values based organization to uh, or, or values based practice, um, which is um, really what sport has been to me is is just a vehicle for self awareness, and from that awareness we can move to self improvement. And it's also been a way from for me really to connect, or I why I think it's important to connect to myself, or uh, for people to connect to themselves and to connect to others. It's a way to feel safe um, and to uh, succeed and fail in that safety, and a way to take risks. So really, when I look at the importance of it, um, and this is this kind of is somewhat infused into my background as a firefighter, also because the. Um, the 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 teamwork required in that field is in often it's based on the the firefighters learning some of these foundational skills as youngsters in a sporting context so kind of a broad overview i guess of, of the importance for, for me beautiful and i'm hearing the safety to be able to take risks and learn and really develop as a human being and then you're doing that also within a team and you're both really it's interesting because we think of boxing as a very individual a visual sport and yet having experienced your environment it's that was one of the main phrases that came from the group was how much iron sharpens iron you know how much we should depend on one another to get stronger our opponents but also each other as part of a team and mark oh my god i love short track so much i really wish you know, if I could relive my life, right? <laughs> so exciting. So many of those principles as well. Do you want to comment a little more on, on that? You know, unique to your sport, what are you seeing in terms of those core principles underlying? Well, I don't, I've only been there for three years now. Um, and I think every time we go and compete internationally, I age five years. I've never been so nervous watching our athletes compete. Uh, because they're on the edge, basically, at each corner. Anybody can go down at any point in time. 
And when you're, we do have a team component in relays. So imagine you work for four years and go to the Olympics and then you show up to the relay and then one falls down and then the rest of the team is out. So I always am nervous for that. So it, it's uh, helping me getting better at managing my own stress uh, watching my athletes compete. Um, one thing I'm going to add, I really like what Craig was saying, um, is one thing that sport does bring to us, the incredible environment it creates can bring different things to different people. So for example, when you decide to engage in a sport as a participant, as an athlete, you make a choice to influence yourself, your health, your mental health, your physical health, and you want to enjoy yourself. And maybe you just want to go as far as you can. When you decide maybe to be an official, a coach, a volunteer, somebody who's outside the actual field of play, you make a decision to help and influence others. So the other athletes. Then there are people also that decide to make uh, another step and the team leaders or managers, and I see several people in this room right now, where you occupy a position and you can actually influence your sport. Now we understand more and more the importance of doing that under the under the umbrella of safe sport. So I think our, our, our chairs are so crucial around that. Absolutely, chairs, presidents, you know, board chairs, you're speaking of, yeah, the governance of it, eh? which is really another coaching role, isn't it? Kind of coaching, overseeing the organization. Love the, the kind of nod to those other roles outside the field of play too, that sport does offer so many different kinds of participation, it's beautiful. All right, we're going to talk about values a little bit later, but I feel like we can, we'll get there. It'll kind of emerge as we talk a little more, but let's start just for the, the audience's perspective too, is what are we talking about when we're talking about culture? It's really such a buzzword right now. We hear it almost ad nauseum. I mean, my school is called the Q School of Communication and Culture, so we feel like we know what it is, but now it's really permeating sport. What, what, how would you describe culture to someone? What do you mean by culture? And why is it important? Go for it, Craig. Yeah, okay. So, uh, thank you. Right. Yeah, okay. So this, this is a big one for me. Um, uh, and, you know, and I, I gave, there are whole schools dedicated just to this, as, as you've said. Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of give just a very brief preamble. So, um, again, I feel, I feel lucky that I, I spent a career as a firefighter, both in the wild fire branch and then also kind of in municipal response and firefighting has a very uh, defined culture it's very strong uh, it's based on safety but also kind of traditional um, elements as well um, so I know I, have, I carry that lens and then for for a couple decades or more this is my 40th year of practice in, in karate I've had these kind of sport and dough cultural infusions as well so um, so really through that lens, um, I'll, I'll kind of answer this. So, so it's, it's really about the written and the unwritten codes. And by codes, I mean the policies and the behaviors, the actions, rituals, attitudes, stories, values, beliefs, principles, just the things that kind of roam around, either they're, they're explicit or they're implicit. Um, it's how we communicate to each other, how we recognize each other, how we organize ourselves, um, in the sport context, and again, in my fire previous fire world, it's it's how we train and how we re compete. Or previously, for for me, it was how we train and how we respond out into the into the community. Um, and the the culture to me is important, really, because it's the it 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 speaks to the human side. It's the underpinnings. Um, it speaks to, in many cases, self actualization, like the motivation why why we're there. Uh, it speaks to how we interact, and it's um, and I, I really believe that as humans we've evolved to work together. You know, we 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 survive to, together uh, historically, and now I think we kind of come together in small teams that you're either racing around a you know very slick ice on very sharp skates at very high speeds, or preparing to combat another athlete from another country with padded gloves on inside of uh, four squares of rope. So uh, it, it's really just really to me, culture is the, it's the how we, we, we do what we do. And you mentioned the, the written and unwritten and the unwritten, you know, that they're, 
these beliefs or values, principles that are governing us, but what about the written? What what do we mean by that? The more yeah, so for 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 me, the written would be things like the selection policies. Um, the the for for us in our organization, we we did uh, an exercise. You know, I had started it when I first came into this organization in in the middle of uh, uh, 2022, and really one of my first steps was to kind of def define our mission, vision, values, and attach some value statements to our to our values. So, so we actually have this as a written poster um, now that we utilize. Um, the selection policies are very you know very important because they they give the explicit uh, communication to the community how our how our uh, processes are going to be handled and and conducted so that athletes can see that they're being treated fairly and and openly and transparently. So those would be just a couple examples of the of the written for the written elements. Thank you because it's so important people we do talk kind of vaguely about it, but now you're making it more concrete as well, both in the unwritten, you know, what that means, what that looks like, those codes that are operating, but also even the ring itself, right? The ring itself, the this, the uh, ice itself, the uniform, the time, type of skates they're using are speaking values, just like in the dojo, they speak values, hey, cool. And how about you, Mark? How would you describe, or how do you, within speed skating, your group, talk about culture? Okay, well, First of all, what's nice is I really uh, like the fact that Craig wanted to make it concrete. We had the same issue. So about two years and a half ago, almost, once we got out of the pandemic, finally, of course, even if it's still creeping around us a bit, um, it was getting more and more uh, visual and people were talking about the importance of culture and what are we going to do about it? Take a 19 or 20 year old and give them all the material, written material around safe sport and the policies and wow, not simple to make it concrete for them, for them. And, and then add to that, that sometimes too many of them see safe sport as being, oh, it's this system there where if there's an issue, I can lodge in a complaint, it'll be confidential, which is nice and important, but safe sport should be a daily thing. So we brought them together and we do that now twice a year. And we said, what, what, what words would you like to use? And then they said, we, it's safe sport, but a high performance level and in short track, people are used that we've been winning medals and medals uh, for the last uh, 40 years now. So how do we make it safe, but efficient? We came up with comfortable and efficient. They wanted to use those two words for our daily training environment. Then from there, we said, okay, that's too easy. What does it mean when you walk into the arena? What does it mean? So we actually sat down together, had a huge brainstorming session. And we said, what does it, let's say you walk into a room and there's 50 people in there working or something. And you're wondering, if I sit down, I don't know these people, what would I see? What would I hear? And what would I feel that makes me think that this environment is both comfortable and efficient? So we came up with answers. We developed our own team codes. I'm going to share my screen again with you guys, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. So get rid of this and then bring you here. Sorry, right there. So this is a team code that was built both by the staff members and the athletes around the fact that we wanted to have an efficient and comfortable environment both when we train at home at the arena or when we actually travel to competitions. What does that mean? How do I behave? What's my nonverbal way to react around others? But every single day. And athletes also recognize through this process that it needs to be safe, comfortable, and efficient for the staff that's taking care of me and offering me some services. So that we came up with this. And then at the end, we said, it'd be nice to have picture that summarizes the whole thing. And we wound up with this. We see this everywhere in our team locker room now, which is basically, we all know the old saying, people either people see the glass half full or half empty, but we go further than that. We say in high performance sport, the part that's already half full represents the fact that we are lucky 
we work in sports um, and we want this to, to be dynamic. We want this to be comfortable. And then the part that we're trying to fill up every single day is the efficient part. If we are, if we are to be efficient and trying to be successful internationally, we, tr we need to come in every single day and try to fill up our glass. But we do it knowing that the part half full is the importance of the comfortable, safe part. So interesting that during the process, we said, okay, we need a code of one pager. And after that, what could we have as an image that reflects that every single time we walk into the environment? So concrete again, like you, Craig. Love it. And I think that segues nicely into Craig, that my next question too, about sharing a few of the things you've actually developed or been working on, how they came to be. I know Craig has stories as well, but I want to say, Mark, thank you. you're a man after my own heart here with the metaphor and the, the visual is so powerful, right? It speaks to people in so many ways. And that beautiful exercise is of not only what we're hearing, but also see and feel inside. Comfort and efficiency, beautiful. We're aspiring, but we need to be safe, like Craig was mentioning to be able to take those risks to make it better too, right? And there, in uh, the work around psych safety, they talk lots about comfort with discomfort, like being comfortable to ask the questions, request help, challenge things, you know, acknowledge we, we don't have a full glass yet, yeah. Love it. Thank you. And Craig, mm -hmm. can you share a little bit of your stories or the initiatives you've worked on in boxing? Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, th thanks for sharing that. I'm, I'm taking notes. Uh, I, I really feel like we're part of our process, which I'll share, um, we, as we refine it and mature, I want to get us to the point where we have these shortcuts. I think that metaphor of the glass is a great shortcut because it's, it's almost a heuristic where you can, it just goes to the meaning rather than have to go through all the, the kind of cognitive pathway of, of the, what a written, you know, matrix looks like. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just share my screen here for just a moment and just share a couple of the, the tools that we've got out, you know, and I, I use tools that, as a, in a general term, but, and this is a very, you know, much, much like um, Mark's uh, short tracks team code. This is just a very simple poster. So I, I, I've printed these up. Uh, we take them on tour with us and this was, you know, and I, and I it's a lot of words, but it's basically four kind of pillars of our our values of excellence teamwork purpose and attitude and then we've gone through uh uh and this has been kind of iterative over probably 18 months now of really defining each of these areas and trying to uh explicitly place them and now our challenge and this is i think the challenge of every organization is to continue to live these and even in the in the toughest times uh, in the most challenging circumstances, whether it's an individual that's being challenged or the team that the training group is being challenged, is still trying to maintain these uh, agreements or these these statements here. Um, so just very simply, you know, under excellence is we're disciplined, determined, and willing to do the hard work required to achieve boxing excellence. So these these are athletes' words compiled into the uh, just to the the, the poster here. Um, so that's one tool we use. Um, and then down at the bottom, just questions that I continually ask the athletes to ask themselves is, how do they want to represent Canada? How do they want other countries to think about Canadian boxers? And how do um, you want other boxers to think about you in specific? And then obviously a countdown just for the day. So I think this 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 was a comp this was a poster from a number of competitions ago, but we just keep that countdown going. Um, one other tool that we've been using here, and I'll stop sharing and actually use a, sorry, just to go off screen here for a moment. So this is the, an actual poster and I'm sorry, but the blurring. So, so on the recognition side, so we just use a shout out poster here and sorry, my filter is not going to allow me. Oh, it's, fine. Here. it's fine. So just on the recognition side, so this is just one directed back at me, but it's just an entire page where we can recognize each other. So each of the athletes would get one of these on their door. Uh, and when we go into an event uh, as a way to just make sure that we're um, thinking about each other and recognizing, because we often, you know, we, we it's very easy for us to focus on the things that we're not good at. So we just want to keep the kind of the, the mood of the 
uh, of the team focused on the positive, uh, focused on the excellence and the growth. And so just have each of the team members provide a, a very brief feedback to each each other in a written format so that it becomes out there explicit and the, and the athletes can read back uh, what their teammates think of them. And you really incorporate a reflection of the Canadian cultural values as well in there, right? That well, how do we want to represent Canada? And what is, I, I know talking with Seth, your SNC guy, you know, about what's the Canadian style of, of boxing too? How do we want to be representing our country and the people that we are actually a, a part of, the community we're part of? And uh, the monitoring, I'm seeing some monitoring in there as well, like checking in, how are we doing the feedback processes? Mark, do you have things like that where you're kind of, how are we doing with this, with this image, this metaphor that we have, or with our code that we've laid out? Do you have a practice around that? Or what do you think works? You We're fairly really lucky because on the podium, which is our, our main partner uh, that targets the funds from Sport Canada, um, also came in and said, we've developed this tool that uh, we can help you take a picture of the, let's say the current um, health of your wellness plan and your your current health of your your um, the environment where you're at. So we've worked with, we started to work with them last fall. We've developed, they've developed a, a questionnaire that goes around and it comes back and it speaks to us. So it says, we're doing pretty good in this area. We probably can be more engaged in trying to make sure that people feel comfortable a bit more around these issues. And it guides us on strategies for the next six months. So uh, I don't know if you heard about that, Craig, probably, but the, the CAT, they call it C-A-A-T. So right now we are very much engaged in that process and involves athlete reps, coaches. We have our safe sport officer that's currently online with us right now in this group. So twice a year, we go through the actual um, process of answering all these questions through the questionnaire. Results come back. And then we have a discussion on strategies to try to bridge the gaps where we're not as efficient or as comfortable as we, as we would like to be. Yes, and I know Boxing used this process as well. It's such a great tool, right? A little feedback tool, survey. And uh, it's a great starting point from which to then do that work of, okay, where are the cultural cracks that we need to address and bring into alignment? We say we value this, but we have something that contradicts it still or where people aren't feeling like it's it's what we promised ourselves we would achieve. Yeah, great. And you also talked about meeting with everybody twice a year and kind of checking in on things. And I yeah. think it's a good insight and a good um, good way to share with the rest of the sports system that it, you know, it doesn't have to be cumbersome. Yes. It be something to build in. Well, one thing that I've, I've uh, lived through uh, my years uh, taking care of a couple of high schools was we need to find ways, if all you have are rules and you spend most of the time policing the rules in your school, your environment, you're, you're missing the boat. So the way to actually make sure that you're not policing rules is to engage athletes slash students in the process of decision making. So we all try to do that. So we came up with great ideas. So for example, athlete reps as, as everybody has, we had that in the past, but they basically would come to board meetings sometimes or, or um, general assemblies. Now we actually in, embed them in, in, in like weekly decisions. Like for example, a couple of days ago, I met with my national team reps very quickly in five minutes as they came out of the ice and they said, Guys, what are we currently missing in the locker room? We did this huge upgrade a year ago. What are we missing? So they went back to the athletes, came back with some suggestions. In the past, we would probably sit down with the coaches and say, we got a couple of bucks uh, on, on hand. What do we do to enhance the environment? So it was always reverting back to the people leading the groups. Now it's actually the participants. We also started something uh, two years ago, did the same thing this past summer. Yeah, Craig was talking about our technical roles. How do we select people to represent us and what we call our technical bulletins. Uh, so um, the last two summers, we spent a full afternoon during the summer where we went to sport uh, and we sit down and review some of the 
technical rules together with the athletes. You can't imagine the great ideas they came up with, things that probably would not come just from the staff. So they said, what if we did this to select people to go to World Cups? So we actually in, in include them in things that we would never have done in the past because we thought, no, no, this is a leadership decision made by a staff member, made by a director. So you engage them, you engage them in even in roles. How should we conduct ourselves as we're leaving for Beijing uh, in a couple of weeks? What do we expect of each other? Engage them in there. And then all 20 people traveling are policing the roles instead of being the coach policing the role. So we're looking for ways to that being not just three times a year where you have a responsibility as an athlete rep, but more, and it's not simple because sometimes I would like to engage them more and sometimes I need to pull back, let them just be athletes and compete and train. So it's, it's the balance between trying to find the proper time to engage. That's why if I revert back to my team code again, maybe you've seen that to some of them some of you guys are quick. So we want athletes to engage, but that means I need staff who empower them. If I want them to engage, I need to create space for them to engage. So it's also educating us as staff not to dictate, determine everything in advance, implicate your athlete in the tactical strategy that we'll do in the next race. Question him, what do you think we should do? to make it to the semifinals. So a lot more daily engagement of the athlete and the decision-making process. And thank you for highlighting how that is also very concrete. Like you have to actually make space for that, create a channel, create the comfort for them to actually speak their minds or share without feeling like something's gonna happen yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as a result, right? But but it's very concrete. You gotta create, create the opportunity. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Not simple, but again, last half full. So looking to see how we can uh, be a bit more efficient and comfortable in the end of our season and next season. And again, I just picked up a couple of great ideas from Greg. I like this poster idea and things that you can submit to others. It shows that uh, the empathy of maybe the person in front of you is currently living or situation they're facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that and that um, <clears throat> the shout out poster came to us from our mental performance consultant. She she implemented that at the Commonwealth Games in twenty two, and uh, and the athletes really liked it. So we've just been running with it. And that allows, I've seen it with Craig's group where they can be all policing or at least you know monitoring, checking yeah. in with each other, and because they can point to the hey, we said this. Yeah. What are we doing? Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Nice real and par paradigmatic shift. The actual physical environment, I could not believe how much they engaged when I sat down with them about maybe, it was maybe 16 months ago. And I said, I could not believe that the team locker room that we have for such a successful uh, Olympic program. It was, well, let me show you something. Yeah. And, and the athletes decided to jump on and said, yeah, we need to do something. So I'm gonna share something here. It's actually a quick video clip. So turn this down, turn this down, go here. <laughs> All right. So let me show you something here. This is, by the way, a picture of the locker room we used to have a couple of years back. This is now what we have because two athletes helped me find major sponsors to make this happen. Fast forward this a bit. Everyone likes to shop. Everybody likes to shop. So the actual coaches got together to build the space, to save money. 
money was found by athletes, like I said, to uh, get some funding to get this ready. These, these are coaching staff actually putting the whole thing together. Yeah, we did not save on food. <laughs> so slowly but surely, and, and then we made this an environment that was designed by the athletes. So towards the end of this, I'll bring you there where we actually show almost the final result here. So there's a lounge area, a kitchenette area, but nothing of this would have happened, I think. I mean, it's difficult to get funds to do anything right now, but it's the athletes that decided to make it their own because we empowered them to do it. So, yeah, I think, I thought it was something interesting to show you that it's sometimes concrete can actually really be concrete and your physical environment engage them in that and then they're so happy I, I mean i was there this morning i'm still thinking wow it's always clean everything is always perfect and they said mark of course we helped you build this we want this to be clean and perfect well, that's a commitment yeah yep. mm -hmm. really yeah and i think it. oh sorry go ahead craig I was just gonna say, and I think when the athletes see their fingerprints all over it, it's the ownership. You you cannot buy that level of ownership. It's you can't teach it. It is it's into the DNA of the of the athlete and the organization and the sense of pride and and ownership is is uh, you, you know, it's yeah it's pride never going away. It's never going away. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see the same relationship. Having met Craig's uh, team, the coaches. The, uh, the uh, IST, the integrated sport team, and all the sports scientists, and then the team itself, and all the different kind of ages and experiences and, and weight classes and genders of this group, and how I, I see the same sort of partnership model, where we have clear responsibilities. Uh, no one's more important than the other. We're working together to achieve excellence, and I really see this in both programs. It's so great to get to know more about your program, Mark. Any more sharing, sharing of processes or things that have been exciting that you've implemented that athletes have collaborated on or other people within your team? Any things, Craig, you want well, to share? Well, maybe what I, I'll, I'll just share, just to kind of pick up on Mark's point there around engaging the athletes. So um, just prior to me entering this organization, an athlete committee was formed. It there, there hadn't been one previous. So this is in that early, early 22. So, um, so in boxing that I believe that athlete committee is still finding their voice, but they've been doing um, some very good work uh, advocating for what they would like to see the organization transition into. Um, they get a, they, they vet and review the selection procedures for like the athlete selection procedures before they're published. So I, so they, they get their, have their, their fingerprints on it as well. Um, and just as Mark was saying, it's sometimes the, the question in my role too is same as Mark is how much to give them because they are training, you know, they're doing two trainings a day and, and I don't want to overwhelm them with, with these things which are, which are kind of on my desk, but at the same time, I really need their input. Uh, I value their input and, and, and they, they want to give me their input as well too. So it's really this back and forth in, in my world of making sure that they're aware of something and if they want to give input, then they can. And, and if it's not, then, then that's fine too. We'll continue to, to move forward. Um, one thing also I did initiate here when I came in was to start uh, updates, like just a town hall meeting, much the same format as this but uh, a monthly town hall meeting where every club coach, and, and so we're one, one thing I, I think I should give for context is approximately half of our team vying for Olympic uh, berths right now. So the, the team that went to Santiago at the common or the, the Pan American games, and then we're, we'll be heading out to our first world qualifier shortly, half of them, about half are centralized in, at the, the national center at the, the INS in Montreal, and then half are club based across the country. So, there's a couple here in in Victoria, Niagara Falls, uh, Mississauga. So they're they're kind of spread out across the country. So so we do have a challenge in that we have in that we have a, a cohesive 
training group at the INS in Montreal, but then we have a number of our athletes in the clubs and then they come together on our, on our tours. So, so one of the challenges we face is, is this centralized decentralized uh, model. Um, so one, one of the, the strategies are, that I've found seems to be working well is to hold monthly updates. Um, so I just have a one hour open meeting. Anybody can attend athletes, uh, provincial athletes, national athletes, club coaches, national coaches, everybody's in the virtual room. And I just run through the inventory of the things that are top of my mind and our, and the high performance programs mind in this, you know, in this period. So everybody understands what's going on um, and they can either align their provincial programs to it, or they can just be in the loop basically. So just a, a, another action to just keep the communication going. Um, and then what I think it does is it puts me in front of them, allows them to, to see um, my face, know that I'm accessible and that I'm working towards, you know, our, our performance goals, but that their input is, is valued and we do it either in the call or we do it um, or, or they have my email and they can contact me after. Um, so, so that would be just, uh, I guess, another example of how we can keep the communication channels as open as possible and, and really get everybody's feedback and input. Here are three other examples for, for us, Jennifer. Um, the first one, uh, Craig also mentioned it. So we have a new CEO in place who's actually in the room with us right now. But uh, he is now leading every two months or so, and same as a boxing an athlete town hall. And what this creates is instead of having direct contact with coaches all the day or with me once a week, they also have access to people working in communications and marketing and the CEO. So that's, I think that's crucial. They feel that they're, they understand the structure of the organization and have a, a, a at least a voice to the different sectors, mm -hmm. which I don't think really happened before in the past. Second example is we always had athlete reps, but on the national team, mm -hmm. but it, a high performance programs includes development athletes and the next gen terminology used by uh, on the podium. So I now have next gen athlete reps and that's, oh, what a difference. Things that they view from their chair that we never think of because we're always thinking of people at the top of the pyramid, their leaders. So sh they should be good to represent everybody. Not exactly. So that to me made also a difference at the tables and some conversations. And then thank you, Craig, for saying the word, we are extremely centralized and I thought we were too much. So for example, sometimes in the past, there was a diamond athlete somewhere that at 17 year old made the national team, okay? The automatic reflex was to centralize this young kid to Montreal even if he was from BC or anywhere, don't think about language or school, crazy situation. So now, even for our next gen athletes, we try to keep them decentralized as long as possible until the environment is comfortable and they're ready for it. So we'd rather keep them in, in their environment and their club, or we have now development centers, regional development centers, and we work with the coach where they can develop locally. We've never done that before. So again, it comes back to our main principle, which is it needs to be feel comfortable for everybody. And sometimes it means maybe it's just too soon for me to be centralized. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and I think that I think that recognizes the overall load that an athlete is placed under, not just the training load, but is it academic load? Is it just the fact of moving to a new city? And we've experienced this in our organization too, is that that the, 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 the there can only be so much load, whether it's training load or yep. relationships or school or whatever. Yep. Um, and, and so that has to be accommodated into the entire, you know, treating the athlete as a human while still trying Kind of have the performance right it's the, the 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 two by two grid of performance versus person that that is foundation yeah. to the cat and craig i want to add that personally what i think i brought to the program is my background in education and i also worked 26 years as a football coach a university football coach and then one time somebody told me when i came back to olympic sports somebody said mark 
you can't really be an Olympic athlete and go to university at the same time. And I said, oh, by the way, I've coached Laurent Duvernay-Tardif. Uh, anybody who knows this player, he won an NFL Super Bowl and is also a McGill uh, physician. He's an official doctor. So he went through both at the same time. So I said, nobody will tell me that it's impossible to do. So we just had a great leader uh, that we, in year two of our quad, her name is Kim Boutin. She announced last winter, she's a four-time uh, Olympic medalist, announced last winter that she would not compete during this fall semester because this was her time to complete her stage. And then for me, knowing that she's getting eventually close to the end of her career, I'd like her to finish her career with a diploma in her pocket and not start working on a diploma when she's done. And then we've done that. We made sure she could train at night sometimes and train with the younger athletes, kept in shape, came back on the ice a couple of weeks ago. She's ready to go. And now we can find, we can focus on the last two years of the quads. So sting, things that we did not do in the past, again, being comfortable and efficient is not the exact same plan for everybody. Beautiful. You're both highlighting that. I think we've gotten a bit too fixated uh, over the last decade on the technical, <laughs> tactical, physical, when we, re we really need to also value what Peter Baxter is saying in the chat, even, you know, this idea that you, you gain a lot of power and energy from feeling comfort and seeing your progress educationally, knowing your career is being taken care of. And I can now focus on my performance, can't I, if I know I'm going to have that diploma in my pocket. And the relational and the environmental, if you're 17, you know, being able to stay in a comfortable school. Beautiful. People performance, Craig was highlighting from the, um, the work that's been done for years on that in different contexts. But in sport, we now have that uh, lovely grid as well, the culture of excellence concept. And what's not working? <laughs> cracks are where the light comes in but what do you feel like mm, we still have this to sort out you know mark you mentioned connecting to the coaches that are working locally with these athletes and and that can be challenging how do you make sure you know you're empowering them or supporting them or you've got a lot to take care of over here and i know craig's craig's dealing with the same thing being even more decentralized and how do you communicate it how do you empower these people how do you keep them all on the same page, feel supported, et cetera. That can be a challenge. We came up with two challenges. I'll start, Craig, if it's okay with you. The first one is, of course, it, it's all around manpower. I'm lucky we're a fairly high-level funded sport. So I have eight full-time coaches. So some of them are next-gen coaches responsible for the development centers across the country. So I've got that, that capacity to do it. And I think that since we have the wellness effect and importance in our program now that we're always missing time to take care of things. Um, and the other thing is there's danger of having all of this on paper. Everybody signs um, <clears throat> what they need to sign on contracts for safe sport and then we park it into a file and then the season starts. Uh, that's why Craig and I have been exchanging on how do we make it concrete, but even when the stove in the kitchen is hot, that's where people have a tendency to be more nervous and stressful. And I say, that's where we need to be right there. Safe sport does not happen in a admin room or an office. It happens on the field of practice and the field of play. So I always say to both my athletes and my coaches, nobody raises their voices. Doesn't matter if you're angry, disappointed, doesn't matter. We never raise our voices. And sometimes if I'm only there once a month, I don't know exactly what's, what's, the, what's the feeling around the, uh, the environment. So I need to be there. So that means if I spend more time in the environment, understanding, sharing, I got less time to manage the program. So the challenge is that manpower comes down sometimes to money, of course. But um, I would also say that it's difficult to make this happen once the season and the competition season starts. Mm -hmm. Athlete reps are not as available. We would like still to engage them. So that's the difficult part I'm still challenged with. 
How do I make sure that during the six months of what we talked about during the summer, we want to be good, we want to do this, that actually happens. And if it doesn't, to address it. That's a challenge to me. And under pressure. And that's sport. <laughs> yes. It's a challenge, isn't it? And yep. Craig, how about you? Mm -hmm. Well, so really, you know, capacity is for sure up there. And I kind of embedded that. So, so really, for me, it's fragmentization. And kind of on the flip side of that, it would be the consistency and, and integration. Um, and again, I look and, and this, I, I, I think this of the the sports system, but then also obviously as a micro example of a one NSO, and we're you know we're small NSO, low capacity, relatively low funding, uh, comparatively to some other sports, but we but we at least you know we're centralized and we have full time coaches, um, but. Um, I, I, you know, we have a lot of, and I'm again, my, I have a lens of, of of a former responder where I worked in systems of integration across multiple agencies, and and so there are national integrations and local integrations around emergency service. So, so what I see here is we do have integrations, like we have we have Canadian Sport for Life as an integration model. We have NCCP, we have Game Plan, we have Copson. Um, uh, and then we have the provincial sport organizations, the P, the, the PTSOs, um, but really for the for the most part, a lot of the NSOs. Like this is the first time I'm meeting Mark, for example, and he's a performance performance director just like I am. Uh, but you know, for the most part, the NSOs kind of work in isolation, and there will be integration within their sport. But but at that top level, I think there are uh, there's there are probably more. Uh, similarities than differences between even a sport like a combat sport like boxing and a, and a racing sport like um, speed skating. So I see, you know, the, the NSOs and the PTSOs and the LSOs, the local sport organizations like the clubs, they're often kind of in isolation. Uh, and again, there'll be vertical integration in the sport, but not as not much integration. So is it really a system, you know, from, from the Canadian context? Uh, and even in my micro world of boxing is a lot of our clubs don't necessarily interact heavily with each other because they're competitors and not so much collaborators and and i'm very i'm very keen on this idea of competitive collaboration like i i really think for a small boxing nation like canada we we really have to like compete together at the athlete level but the, the leaders need to be collaborating to figure out how we can compete against brazil and the usa and and the other countries um so and 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 really you know again in my world it's 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 low capacity but high demand you know high expectations um so um so i i do think that there can be an improvement in alignment so so really for me it would be fragmentation would would be kind of one of the biggest challenges what's something that you've you've been trying or what do you think you've seen have you seen an example of even a micro example of where you might be able to scale it up and make it work for your broader system. But is there something that you're noticing that is indicating some success around that consistency integration? Um, Put me on the spot. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've, we've recently come through the check-in that we did with you. So we, we do know the culture is improving just at a general sense, like the, the, the stakeholders feel that from a cultural standpoint. Um, I feel that one of our tools that we will that we've developed and will be integrating more is our is under our podium pathway is our our winning style metrics. So this to me is going to be a, a very concrete tool that while I'm not sure how much it'll influence culture, it'll definitely clarify expectations and pathways, uh, which will you know influence perceptions of athletes of fairness and transparency, and also you know give external markers of performance. Um, that we were looking for. So, so I do think with this winning style metric, and you know, it, it's a very challenging sport in many ways because the win is held in the minds of five judges that is sit around the ring and they vote. And the voting structure is done round by round, but it's not as concrete as a ball and a goal or a puck in a net or a skate across a line, right? Like it's it, it can be very, very gray. And, and so we need to 
work our best to understand what the elite level judges are looking at and 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 codify that put that into a into a document and then bring that out into the clubs so that they are training towards those metrics so this 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 is would be a you know this is an, a, i think a granular example like a thread that would bring that tie the the club back up to the national team so that we they understand precisely where they need to be going along but it, it but it's a hard one to define because it's it's a it's an interesting sport in in that in that sense the beautiful i love the threads right the connections i mean this is where the communication comes into the cultural aspect and also the winning style clarity brings integrity when we have clarity then we trust what's going on and then that gives us that sense of I can breathe in comfort and now I know I can focus on my performance because that's being taken care of or I know where or what I'm supposed to be doing or what I'm supposed to focus on hey brilliant how about you Mark do you have something that you feel like yeah there's another challenge that I wanted to bring forward and I think every single sport has the same issue is the fact that name any sport add the word Canada to it all of a sudden you have a national responsibility speed skating Canada well, we have all these clubs everywhere. If there is a safe sport mm -hmm. issue somewhere that you have no control on the coach that's there, on the parents, on the officials, but there's something pops out on social media, all of a sudden you're responsible for that because you are a speed skater in Canada. So we can, both Craig and I can try to enhance and make our environment better and better culturally. But to actually have that trickle down toward the club level, we need to make sure that the provinces and most of mo most of the provinces do it now. But to align that and to actually have, do it with people that, that don't have professional or full time uh, coaches on their staff, I think that's an issue. Safe sport for all around the sport cannot be managed or can be maybe um, modeled by us for some things, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to uh, have a a complete grasp on that, knowing that it may still impact us if something happens somewhere that you have no control on. And I'm seeing your model of engaging and empowering within your environment, your high performance environment could be replicated or applied to the same issue, right? Because there's only one of you, there's only this one little NSO. How do you take care of everybody you know it's almost like you have to like a fractal replicate it across or empower everybody yeah consistently like craig is saying you know hmm. and even in my own environment uh, jennifer i mean i've been forcing when I, I said that even to own the podium i said you know what i'm going to make a choice i could spend easily my 50 hours a week in my office managing programs managing budgets reporting there's enough work for that I make the choice to be late on emails some days, late on reporting, because I want to manage people. And I want to be there. I want them to see me so they don't just see me when there's an issue. They see me just to say, good job, good training. How's it going today? How's your math class at, at, at high school? How's your English class at university? So they see that I'm mm -hmm. engaged and, I'm, I'm, and I want to know about them as a, as a person that takes time so i i make my time that's and again i try to i always said i i don't see myself as managing human resources i try to manage resources humanly mm -hmm. and that means i need to have my boots on the ground mm -hmm. back to your point about you know you can have it written down the paper is important but it's the action that comes out of the implementation, the follow-up, so crucial too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, sport. These are ultimately human systems. You know, they're not. They're not. It's not Amazon getting. You know, getting my widget to my door in a, in, in two days. It's it's they're they're humans, and they're mostly you know young adult humans who are who are excelling in a particular chosen activity. You know, very specialized activity. Uh, and led by coaches who grew up inside of the, doing that same activity as well. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's all humans. And humans are complicated and complex. Mm -hmm. And so how does this, let's, let's go bigger and talk about just some of the challenge you see our system 
I mean, I like the point you made, Craig, that is it a system? Because <laughs> are we actually connected? That's a good question, right? And maybe that's one of the main pro problems or challenges we're really facing is we're off in all directions, all well-meaning and well-intentioned, but is there some sort of cohesive plan and design around it all? That could be a, a big challenge we face. And before we all came on, Mark was making the point that Canada is so big, you know, we always have that geographical challenge. What are some of the yeah. other ones you see us facing in Canada right now? Wow, there could be a lot of different answers to that one. Geography is my probably same thing for, for Craig. Every single NSO geography is an issue. Just to bring kids together for a regional championship or just a competition, that's an issue. Um, the second one, I think, is because of geography, how do you align people on some of these processes? So even if I have a what I call a next-gen B center in Calgary, I have another one in Quebec City. Well, I don't see them more than three times a year. Thank God for Zoom and Teams and almost thank God, thank you in a sense to the pandemic that gave us that legacy. But it's, it's just not the same. So we can have this, this type of conversation, but there's nothing. When I said, what does it, the environment look like, sound like, feels like, I need to be there to catch that and to have a better understanding. So um, maybe the system should be different. I'm not sure if, if the system with one HPD that oversees everybody is the exact system. Uh, I like the fact that uh, we now have help from safe sport officers that will help us with some of these issues. But uh, I think eventually if Sport Canada and the government of Canada really wants to have tools in place, they'll have to invest also in wellness. Yeah, fully. And um, and a consciousness a reflection and maybe the this new inquiry will or exploration will look at the regional aspect of our country and how to address that the disparateness and the, the actual complexity of trying to bring people together into competitions even right okay what else craig what are some of the big ones you see uh the, sorry challenges yeah yeah well for sure for sure the the capacity you know financial uh human resources and again i i my my major experience has been in low capacity organizations uh, you know, combat sports primarily. Um, and so we are, we are staffed with, um, uh, right now two full-time coaches, but, a, uh, quite a number of volunteer coaches who support us on the road. Um, and then just really three people working in boxing Canada right now with, uh, kind of in the, aside from the coaches. So there's a lot to do, um, and it, and it becomes a, a challenge. So, and just like Mark said, I find myself doing the same thing. I'll, I'll intentionally uh, miss some aspects of my job description in order to focus on others that I have to give priority priority to in that time. So, um, and and again, my organization is not one where we have someone dedicated to safe sport or someone dedicated to communication. So we have a few people doing a lot of wearing a lot of different hats. And uh, so, yeah. Well, I even the, love the what what Mark said about a 50 hour work week, <laughs> you know, mm, that's a lot yeah. of hours in work week. Yeah. but that's sport too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We even how to sustain yourselves in trying to accomplish all these things, prioritizing, you know, and getting real clarity around what is most important in this moment and when challenging stuff and, and culture can help with that. I've heard you say things like bringing that clarity, bringing some comfort, um, creating a really inspiring environment, making sure we're connected and understanding. So you avoid a lot of the the, the uh, things that can blow up, right? If you have a lot of connection and understanding of one another, you won't have as many conflicts probably, or you'll have ways to address frictions or challenges under stress on that hot stove. <laughs> All right. It sounds Jennifer, like Jennifer, yeah, there's ahead. one last one that I think it's, currently becoming a challenge at least for us and I had a couple exchanges with, with other sports people that have the same role that I have um, because of some of the bad um, media sport has had over the last 10 years and the great thing that bounced back from that with having 
all this system of safe sport and things that how we should behave and contracts that we sign just before the season started coaches meeting brainstorm and how do we see the season and towards the end we start having a conversation around what the, we decided to call the coaching gray zone which is if you go back 40 years back you would see coaches pushing on athletes and trying to motivate them and because we want to make sure we can get better and then nowadays I hear more and more coaches saying, I don't know what's my limit. Where can I, where do I have to stop pushing? Nobody has the same limit. I'm just trying to motivate them because they need it. They're down They're They got uh, something happening at home. They don't feel as motivated. They need a coach to push them. It's becoming an issue. I got coaches now saying, I'm almost waiting for the athlete to say, can you help me? Can you push me coach? I need you to push me today. You understand what I mean by pushing Jennifer? Eh? So mm -hmm. it's becoming an issue because now everybody's nervous that it won't be received the same way by all 17 athletes around me. So yeah, I feel that's slowly becoming a challenge. We call it, we're calling it the coaching gray zone internally to see how we're going to try to strategize around that. Yeah. And I think it comes back to your, the comfort and efficiency thing where we ultimately, we want to be better. So how do we do that in a way that's respectful, but yeah. also considers that people still need direction, frank conversation, you know, welcoming criticism and, and not all criticism is going to be a complaint worthy, you know, <laughs> like having to reconcile that is really important. So you're right. And we are in a gray zone right now where we're not. I think clear, we're probably going too far this way and we need to mm -hmm. figure out what's appropriate. So is raising your voice appropriate? What do we mean by that? What's that actually look like? When does it go over the line of violence and abuse? Mm -hmm. Well, and we, we had this conversation in our organization as well. And anecdotally, we have heard, uh, and we're, we're taking a page from what we're hearing from Canoe Kayak is that they, in their training loads, they will rate a week as either a red, yellow, or a green week, which indicates levels of intensity. And the levels of intensity are communicated. Um, and so our coaches have been experimenting, experimenting with this in our national center. So the intensity could be a metabolic load, it could be a technical tactical load, it could be a cognitive load, or it could be a feedback or a coaching feedback load. So there can be, um, you know, a, pre a conversation previous to a red week <clears throat> that an athlete understands red week might mean slightly elevated voices, more, more, uh, what could be perceived as aggressive nonverbals and a more push, a more pushing attitude than a green week, but it's not just being thrown. It's not reactive. You know, and I think if it's the coach doing something that is perceived as aggressive because they're either in an uncontrolled state or they're doing it to satisfy some urge in themselves versus it's a it's something that is benefiting the athlete because the athlete understands it about themselves and i think this is possibly one way to maybe mm -hmm. decrease the size of that grain zone um interesting and, and still get the athlete buy-in and it's all communicated clearly up front and the benefits are communicated if there's no benefit don't do it doesn't make the boat go faster so you just you just stick to the things that are making the athlete get faster around that track or punch more more accurately and harder uh kind of thing i think it's another webinar topic the gray zone that we're in right now right and <laughs> i guess we do have to wrestle this down we got to figure out where how how do we coach in a way that's still motivating exciting pushing giving really frank feedback i know in coaching or sorry in rowing you'd you'd be <laughs> you'd have coaches who would just say nope nope because you're repeating the same stroke much like skating probably but you get that very immediate nope nope yeah and it's yeah. harsh but it's not really you know it's not violent or anything but how do we find what's that's cool mm -hmm. lots of good conversations i think need to happen around that to get that clarity because we've also been taught we've all had coaches who've you know, I had coaches who used oars to kind of hit people with or, or, you know, yell crazily at people and say all these nasty things. That was kind of the norm in, in a certain era. And so how do we move from that into something different? 
uh, when people have also grown up hearing all that, right? And expecting it. Some people think they need that in order to be motivated yeah. to perform. Yeah. There was something, just share just a, an, an experience that happened at the end of the, of the last season. Uh, we are, I don't know which country in Europe, but we're writing our turn for uh, ice time training the day before a World Cup starts. So we're all in the stands because our bus arrived a bit earlier at the arena. We're all sitting down together and we're watching another country doing their ice time training. And then one athlete, for whatever reason, we can't understand what they say. They're not speaking either French or English. Starts shouting at everybody. We could eventually, eventually make one word that we could understand because it was a four-letter word in English. And it came out a fair amount of times. So everybody in the arena was, and I was expecting, okay, coach will go, ask the person to leave. Nothing happened. They just continued like nothing had happened. So the reaction from our athlete was internally, it was, oh my God, thank you. They said, that's unacceptable. If, if that was one of my fellow colleagues or athletes, I would have went as an athlete. So I thought, oh, wow, we're miles at least ahead because we're conscious of tr trying to make an environment a bit better. And to me, that was a, a nice um, example of some of the values that are now embedded in our athletes, that that's not acceptable and they would not let it go through, even if it comes from an athlete. And can we drill it down to what's fundamental, that respect? Is it respect? What's that really about, you know? So what's governing our actions? What's the fundamental assumption? Hmm. Oh, I think th this is our conversation in Canada right now, right? We have to figure it out because we've left a lot of coaches and athletes in the dark a little bit on uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. what is acceptable. Hey, what is the vision? Okay. Is it possible to achieve this idea of well and safety, wellness, safety, humanity in our sport, as well as optimal, excellent ex uh, performances, not just experiences, but peak performances? Is it possible? Some people think it isn't. Some people think that we're, we're sliding over into this participation ribbon realm where everybody gets a prize and nicey nice. What do you think? We're currently trying to make it happen both at the same time, comfortable, efficient. I'll, I say time will tell. The fact that I'm in, myself and coaches are adjusting to a lot of the, um, let's say, the other life components of our athletes. I mentioned one is uh, taking four months off, but it's happening all the time. Things that we did not adjust in the past. How much will that affect their mid to long term performance? I think we need a couple of years to see. If, I, I hope not. I think not because I come from school sport and university sports where both had to live together. But um, in a system where we're still competing with countries and Eastern European countries, with just about being an athlete and the rest will come later on in your life. Can we follow? I have to wait before I can answer. Craig, what do you think? Mm. Yeah, a tough question. Uh, the optimist in me says yes. I think, you know, is this question like the four minute mile, right? The four minute mile, once it oh. was broken, it was broken. And and our minds got expanded. The human minds around running got expanded to a new, a new idea. Um, you know, what one thing, when I was thinking about this question, uh, and again, because I spent a career as an emergency responder and high performance is not exclusive to sport. As much as we in sport think we're, you know, the True. epicenter, uh, it's not. So, you know, their medical operating rooms are high performance environments. Military response is a high performance environment. Emergency yeah. response is a high performance. Business has high performance. I sure, and aviation, I want high performance in the cockpit every time I'm flying to a competition. I don't want low performance. So, so we do see high performance and I won't say any of those are, you know, perfect because we don't know, I don't know what the insides, but I, I do know in my realm, a former realm is, is uh, we have 
firefighters who need to uh, be working at a high performance level in life threatening conditions, but these can these responses also affect them mentally and psychologically under the kind of critical incidents. So, so the 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 idea of of supporting the like always challenging but always supporting you you crib up as you go is I think important. So I I think we if we're an experiment in this country we don't quite know how far we can go up without all the cribbing, the supporting that comes up underneath it. Um, so I do think we have to try, um, but I do think the 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 conversation has to go. And I and I don't think we have to place, um, I, I think we just find ways of doing the things that we're doing while still respecting the human. So again, if a red, if a red, yellow or green weak uh, allocation is a way to give permission to be a coach, to be aggressive, and motivational, again, for the good of the athlete towards a performance that it's all agreed upon ahead of time and is is able to be shown to have no, you know, psychologically damaging effects, um, then then that could be a, a, a good possible way. Um, and I, I will say, again, in my former world, under critical incidents response, we you don't have control over what a firefighter is going to respond to any moment. The bells go and they and they respond. But what they do find <clears throat> is that if there's a an exposure, you need to be well trained for and, and you know respond to that exposure. But on the back end, the psychological damage can be reduced significantly if there are steps taken immediately after the exposure, like a, a diffusing critical incident response kind of uh, diffusing. Um, and then if there's longer term effects, then there there can still be actions after. So it's a, a bit of a response model, but uh, I just use that as a granular example to say that um, th there are, uh, again, other ways of thinking about high performance outside of the sport environment that we can, I think, learn from. I think sport can still learn a lot from, from the way uh, uh, business organizations are structured or schools are structured because, because uh, again, it's, 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 I think we've grown up in a, or developed a sport system that's Kind of isolated from some of these other other re real human constructs too, right? Like a an inst an education institution is a human construct. It's it's housed with humans for humans to get better in. And you raise the idea of humans being very unpredictable as well, right? So we can't mm -hmm. be expected to be perfect all the time, or we be kind of automatons. And so being prepared for all of those aspects and dynamics, um, lots of good training, mm -hmm. but it's possible and. I also see a potential for us to actually value, like you're both saying, to val see that there is value in having a complex life that involves education or a career path or you know that kind of is, is actually adding to the person's performance instead of always assuming it's going to take away. Um, that's a paradigmatic shift our country might have to really think about a little more too. And as you say, over time, we'll experience it and see it. Um, yeah, and we have models, we have examples over history, but also currently across multiple sports that have been able to leverage this, the complex approach to human and human beings, athletes as human beings that has worked. Um, and we see them perform above what we probably would have expected and definitely better than just being ultimately focused only on. There's also this. Jennifer, oh, sorry, go ahead. Jennifer, on that, when, when I shared earlier, remember my glass half full? Yes. There was something in there. I'm going to show it to you again. Okay. All right, I need to get rid of this. Let me bring back. I don't know if you've seen the top part of it. Yeah. So. Because we're in an official conference, I'll say get stuff done. So we say get stuff done. Yes. 360 everywhere at school, in your personal life, and in sport. So we decided to have that as part of our image because um, we're not working with a, a, a robot in a separate world. So even in our world, we want to be aware of the rest of their reality. So we use 360 all the time. Perspective, awareness, wonderful. And yeah. um, 
there, there are arguments from some of the academics doing research on this particular topic, you know, how do we do, how do we do both? How do we value the humanity of these athletes and of sport? And one of the, one of the ways that we've fallen down in the past is to kind of make, and Craig was talking about this sport exempt, like somehow we're not a human construct or it's not the same as education or theater or, or first responders, but it is, you know, we have to abide by the same kind of principles. We're not exempt somehow. Therefore, there's a great comment by Peter Baxter right now. In the, and then that's something I, I had my coaches struggle with one of my vision in my first year. I said, we are lucky enough to have our own natural training center where we have this ice available for us during the day. And it's arbitrary that a coach decides that national train trains on Mondays from 1030 to 12 and the schedule is all set. And I, if I'm a student, and I have a class that day for the rest of the semester, what do I do? Mm -hmm. So it's either I miss practice and then I feel bad, I'm gonna stay fall behind the others or I don't go to my class. I say, wait a second here. What if that day, that national team athlete actually trains on the ice with the next gen group? Mm -hmm. We still have another group going at one, another group going at four. Mm -hmm. So since we've opened up to that, it's, an, it's fairly simple. Coaches would thought that they would still fall behind. They haven't. It has no impact whatsoever. They're still following their own plan. And then it's, sometimes it takes just a small adjustment that's easily feasible, but makes a huge difference. And I, I really like that comment because to me, I'm trying to make sure that people don't think I can only study off season, but in season also. Well, to me, Mark, that's a, a a concrete example of athlete centered. You know, I think I first heard the term athlete centered in the, I don't know, 20 years ago, but are we, are we, are we? Yep. You know, but that to me, that's athlete centered. You, you adjust your program to focus on the athlete and treat them as a human so they can. And I really like this idea of 360. That's amazing. So you've, you've put your, your money where your mouth is by, by actually giving them the opportunity to have a life outside of sport. Um, and well, I like with sport, let's put it that way together well, with sport, it's <clears throat> and checking those assumptions that oh i'm going to train with the younger kids the next gen and somehow that's going to take away no it's going to add you're going to be inspired to be now you're in that leadership role you're the mentor it's uh a, you know as a teacher how in, in how much you actually learn from teaching right so beautiful and being around all that youth and Wonderful conversation. I'm going to wrap us up there because I think that's a, a great place to stop talking about the possibility, talking about the challenges for sure and complexity, but also here are some examples that you've both shared, some brilliant examples of ways we can navigate, be creative, challenge our assumptions. And mostly I'm really hearing a lot of that partnership work together. Don't assume that it's all on you. You know, we're in a big country with a very limited capacity <laughs> and time. Uh, so we really need, I do think that's our, that's our strength as a country that we maybe don't lean on enough. Like we have to be collaborative to survive our cold winters and to uh, be able to achieve things together. We really need to learn how to reach across grand spaces in lots of different figurative and literal ways. Thank you to, I love when Peter comes. Peter's, I, you should all know Peter, you know, he's, he's got a lot of experience. Yeah. Working in the university system and as an athletic director and coach, but um, he's pointing out to the value of the research, right? When we have data to show actually they're performing better when they're doing more things in their life. So beautiful to see. And uh, thanks for your contributions in the chat. We've had some lots of great positive comments about what you're sharing. And I think uh, we'll distribute this broadly and make sure other people benefit from the great learnings that you've shared. You've both shared, I'm really grateful. It's been 90 minutes. So I very much appreciate you taking that time out of your 50 hour work weeks. <laughs> Thank you. This was an opportunity for me to fill up my glass a bit, a bit today. Thank you. That's great to hear. Yes. Good, good point, Mark. Yes. Thank you, Jen. It was a, a, a good opportunity to share what we're doing. Yeah. Craig, next time you're in Montreal, we're going for a coffee. I'm paying. Right? I'd rather go skating. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. <laughs> We'll be watching. Take care, both of you. Thank okay. you so much. And thanks okay. to all of our attendees. Smoke meat. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.